Great. Okay, so I'm Allison Hilger. I am a speech language pathologist as well as a researcher, so I have a PhD, CCD-SLP. So I study how we can improve speech and swallowing in cerebellar ataxia and how we can develop effective speech language treatments. So, some disclaimers, um, as you've seen over and over this conference, right? Um, anything I say today, you should consult with your physician, also your own speech language pathologist. Um, speech and swallowing are very individual in ataxia. Um, a person with SCA3 may have certain characteristics, another person with Friedrich's ataxia may have other characteristics. So both assessment and treatment are very individualized. So you do want to get your own assessment by a speech language pathologist um, to see how you fit into these set of characteristics. Okay. And then my own disclaimers, um, I am employed by the University of Colorado where I receive a salary. I've also received funding by the National Institute of Health and that has helped fund this research. Um, but I have no non-financial relationships to disclose. So this is what I'm gonna go over today. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is overall speech and swallowing difficulties in ataxia. Then I'm gonna give an overview of speech and swallowing anatomy and physiology. So take you through my undergrad 101 class in quick five minutes, right? Then I'm gonna talk about current theories for causes of speech and swallowing impairments in ataxia, the current speech and swallowing therapy options, and then what you can do at home. So we're gonna start with speech and swallowing difficulties in ataxia. So these are the general speech and swallowing difficulties. I am gonna walk us through these in more detail, but just in general to get us started, this is what we generally observe in ataxia. For speech, we notice inconsistent articulatory errors, variable pitch and loudness, a reduced speech naturalness, so how natural speech sounds is reduced, a slow rate of speech, and then occasionally hoarse or breathy voice. And again, I'm gonna go over each of those characteristics in more detail. For swallowing, sometimes food or liquid penetrates the airway but is then coughed out. Sometimes food or liquid is aspirated, meaning it goes into the lungs, it's drawn into the lungs. This can cause aspiration pneumonia. And then sometimes food or liquid is regurgitated nasally. Generally, all of these difficulties are caused because movements are no longer coordinated because of cerebellar damage. But again, I'm going to go over all of these in more detail. Okay, but I do wanna say there's a lot that we don't know about speech and swallowing in ataxia. For example, we don't know how speech and swallowing change by ataxia subtype, um, by ataxia etiology, or even SCA subtype. It makes sense that there are going to be different speech and swallowing characteristics based on SCA subtype, based on ataxia etiology, because there is different damage to different parts of the cerebellum, and either, even, even other parts of uh, brain, stem, spinal cord, and the cortex. But we don't know that yet. We don't have enough participants in each subgroup. Um, a lot of studies, for example, will have maybe five people with SCA3, five people with SCA1, and you can't really make um, definitive observations about speech characteristics with so few participants. So that's one of our goals right now in my lab, but also Adam Vogel's research in Australia, is to get large participant pools in different types of ataxia, so then we can actually start looking at patterns across different subtypes. Um, we also don't know how speech or swallowing difficulties change by the extent and location of cerebellar damage. So there's a lot we don't know, but I will share what we do know. Okay, so overview of speech and swallowing physiology. So we have to go through what it takes to speak clearly, speak intellig intelligibly, and also to swallow efficiently before I can talk about what's going wrong. So the first driving force of speech and swallowing is breath control, respiration. That is the foundation of speech and swallowing. Respiration is the driving force of speech. We talk on the exhale in English. There are a few languages that have some phonemes on the inhale, but not in English, and those are not common languages. How much we inhale before we talk influences how well we control pitch and loudness and also how fatiguing speech is. Speech is likely to be very fatiguing if respiratory control is impaired. For swallowing, swallowing must be coordinated with your respiratory cycle to prevent aspiration of food. It's best to swallow while exhaling so that way you don't inhale food into your lungs while you're swallowing. 
The next component is the larynx. The larynx is this structure within our throat that houses our vocal folds. Um, and this is a picture of what our vocal folds look like. They are a set of muscles, um, and I'm looking at them from above. They're a set of muscles that close when we, when we phonate, and then they vibrate, and that creates our voice. So we can change the shape, the length, the tension of our vocal folds to change our pitch and loudness and vocal quality. For swallowing, the larynx should be completely closed off, and the vocal fold should also be tightly closed to prevent aspiration. Then we have the nasal cavity. People often forget about the nose when we think about speech and swallowing, but it's a really important component. For speech, we can open or close off our nasal cavity depending on what sound we're producing. If you're saying M or N, we want our nasal cavity to be open. Those are nasal sounds. But in general, we want to close our nasal cavity off so that we're directing sound through our mouth. If that, is not, if that does not happen, you may sound hypernasal. It may also be hard to produce sounds like a P or B that require a lot of pressure buildup in your mouth. For swallowing, the nasal cavity should be closed off. If it's not, you may get nasal regurgitation when you swallow. And then our mouth. This is what people often think about for speech and swallowing, but there's a lot more to it. For our, our mouth contains our tongue, our jaw, our teeth, our hard palate, our soft palate. We use all these structures to articulate certain speech sounds. And for swallowing, all these structures are important for chewing up the bolus to swallow. In general, all these components, breathing, phonation, uh, our resonance in our nose, our articulation in our mouth, all of those require very precise coordination. Okay, so some key terms that you may have encountered, either by your speech language pathologist or in the literature. The first term is dysarthria, and this encompasses all these characteristics of speech, articulation, prosody, vocal quality, resonance, intelligibility, naturalness. What does dysarthria mean? Dysarthria is a clinical term for a speech impairment from neurological disorder, specifically impairment in the execution and production of speech. In ataxia, the specific term is ataxic dysarthria. Okay, so ataxic dysarthria. Nicely named, right? Uh, dysarthria from ataxia. Ataxic dysarthria. So if you hear the term dysarthria, that is the speech impairment from neurological injury. Okay, so I'm gonna take us through each of these terms and how they relate to ataxia. The first term is articulation. Articulation means how we use your tongue, lips, teeth, and roof of your mouth to articulate or create speech sounds. For example, when I put my lips together, I can say a sound like B or P. I am articulating with my lips. In ataxia, the movements of the tongue, the lips, the teeth, and the roof of the mouth are uncoordinated. This results in inconsistent articulatory errors. So for example, sometimes you might produce an R correctly, and sometimes you might produce it incorrectly. You may not always produce a certain sound incorrectly. There may be certain sounds that are harder for you to produce, but in general, they are going to be inconsistently produced correctly or incorrectly. Um, there is nothing wrong with the structures of your mouth. There's nothing wrong with your tongue, with your teeth, with the roof of your mouth. It's rather the incoordination among these structures that is impaired. Articulation will also become harder with longer words, statistics, Nintendo, things like that. And also when you become tired, so by the end of the day, it may be harder to articulate sounds. Okay, that's articulation. Prosody, and this is honestly my favorite thing to study when I look at speech. Prosody is how we change our pitch, our loudness, our timing. It's how we express emotion. It's how we sound interesting. When you hear a robot and they just talk monotone, they're not using prosody. So prosody is what makes speech interesting and beautiful. Um, it's how we ask a question versus make a statement. And we change prosody by varying our breathing patterns as well as our vocal fold movements. In ataxia, coordination between breathing patterns and vocal fold movements becomes impaired. And this is what is really significantly impaired in ataxia. Ataxia results in variable prosody, where you get loudness bursts while talking, often at the beginning of a sentence. So you start a sentence and you have a, you start a sentence very loudly and then it becomes more quietly. That is common in ataxia because of the buildup in air pressure. Also, pitch is maybe either too high or too low, um, not quite how you wanted to talk. Maybe your pitch comes out differently than how you intended. Timing of the words is sometimes not correct. Maybe timing is too slow or too fast, or the rhythm of certain syllables is incorrect. 
And then it also may be difficult to express emotion. Someone may perceive that you are angry or bored when you're not, just because of how your speech sounds. So it may be difficult to express emotion because we express emotion through pitch and loudness and timing, which are hard to control in ataxia. So all that is under the term prosody. Then we have voice quality. Voice quality is how clear your voice sounds. Um, when voice quality is not clear, it can sound hoarse, breathy, or raspy, things like that. You control your voice quality by how open or closed your vocal folds are when you talk. In ataxia, the coordination again between breathing and voicing becomes impaired. This results in variable voice quality. So for some people, their voice may always be hoarse or breathy. Other people may find that their voice kind of breaks. Maybe sometimes they have a clear voice, but then it breaks, and then they have a, a pitch break. Or they may sound hoarse for a word or two, but then their, pitch, then their voice goes back to normal. So you may experience that variable vocal quality, where your voice is sometimes clear and sometimes not clear. Then we have resonance. This is how much air goes through your nose while you talk. Air should go through your nose when you say an M and an N, but not for other sounds. And if too much air or sound is going through your nose, you're going to sound hypernasal. In ataxia, the coordination of this velum, which is the flap between your nose and your mouth, becomes impaired. It's all about coordination. That means that sometimes you may sound nasal. Um, sometimes, you, um, sometimes air may go through your nose when it's not supposed to, so you will sound nasal, and sometimes you won't sound nasal. Intelligibility, you may have heard this term in, from a speech therapist. Intelligibility is how many words can be understood from your speech, and it's usually measured as a percentage. So if I were to do a speech evaluation, I would say, patient X has 80% intelligibility, and that means I can understand 80% of their words. Interestingly, in ataxia, often intelligibility is pretty high, and it's what I've noticed when I've done my speech evaluations. I can generally understand 90 to 100% of uh, people's speech that I talk with. Um, that's compared to other conditions like ALS or Parkinson's where speech is much more degraded and it's hard to understand what people say. Ataxia, I often can understand, like I said, 90 to 100% of what people say. Um, so oftentimes speech is generally understandable even when the impairment is more severe. So we have another term that, that better captures the impairment in ataxia, and that's called naturalness. And naturalness is how natural speech sounds. And we rate it on a scale from mo normal, mild, moderate to severe. Naturalness is impaired in ataxia. And it's likely because prosody is disrupted. And so speech will sound less natural when pitch and loudness and timing are slightly off. Um, and so those patterns that we don't really know what exactly is a normal pattern of speech, but intuitively we kind of know whether speech sounds natural or unnatural. And that's what happens in ataxia. It impairs the naturalness of speech. So again, all these terms are related to dysarthria and ataxia. For swallowing, we have two main terms, penetration and aspiration. The term, the clinical term for swallowing impairment is called dysphagia. So you may have heard that term. Um, So-and-so has dysphagia. That means you have a swallowing impairment. So the first term is penetration. This is when food or liquid enters the airway but is coughed out, and that's a good thing. We all penetrate food. It happens. Um, at any uh, anytime we're distracted, often when I'm tired and I'm laying in bed eating chips, right? Food often goes into the airway, but what is good is when you cough it out. That means that you notice it's happening, you cough it out, and it doesn't get into the lungs. So if you find that you're coughing, that is a good sign. That means you have good sensory awareness of the food penetration, and you're getting it out of your airway. But it is a sign that you could aspirate food. Um, it also likely feels like a choking sensation that causes you to cough. In ataxia, incoordination causes the airway to sometimes stay open while you're swallowing. So again, the airway should be completely closed off when you're swallowing. In ataxia, sometimes the airway stays open because of incoordination. That means as the food passes over your airway into your pharynx, which is behind your airway, some of it can sneak down into your airway. And that results in food or liquid entering the airway, and it's likely to happen when you're tired and distracted. Aspiration is the dangerous thing. This is when food or liquid enters the airway but actually gets into your lungs. This can cause, this can cause infection, which we call aspiration pneumonia. Again, in ataxia, like I said, the airway is often open, and so food or liquid can enter the lungs and then cause that infection. 
So going back to that first slide I had, I hope some of these terms make more sense. The speech difficulties in ataxia, inconsistent articulatory errors. Sometimes articulation for a sound is correct, sometimes it's incorrect. Variable pitch and loudness. Pitch and loudness are variable. Reduced speech naturalness, so how natural speech sound is reduced. A slow rate of speech. Oftentimes, uh, people are focusing so much on coordinating all their articulators that it slows speech down. And then it, occasionally a hoarse, breathy voice. And then for swallowing, like I said, sometimes we penetrate food, sometimes we aspirate food, and sometimes food is regurgitated nasally. So why does this happen in ataxia? There are two causes, which I'll talk about. The first theory is cerebellar incoordination. Okay, so the cerebellum coordinates and sequences movements across our mouth, our nose, our larynx, our lungs for speech and swallowing. If there is cerebellar damage, these movements will become uncoordinated. Uh, and this results in movements of the mouth for articulation, vocal fold movements for pitch and loudness, breathing patterns for speech, closing off your airway for swallowing, and sequencing the order of muscular activation for swallowing. So the first theory is cerebellar incoordination. The second theory is cerebellar distortion of sensory feedback. We know that the cerebellum is involved with taking sensory feedback from vision, hearing, somatosensory, which is how you feel things, uh, vestibular um, sensation, how, how you feel in the world, your balance, taste. All those things, the cerebellum takes that information and it integrates it with your current plans for movement. It says, for example, I feel that you swallowed sticky peanut butter, but some of it didn't get all the way down, so you should swallow again so you can get the, the peanut butter all the way down. Or it says, your voice sounds louder than you intended, so you should lower the loudness of your voice. If there's cerebellar damage, it won't be able to accurately integrate sensory information. So um, your body's receiving the sensory information, but you may not be correcting for these sensory errors that you're experiencing in everyday life. So both theories are supported and complementary, meaning there are two main cerebellar roles for speech and swallowing impairments. Again, coordinating sequencing muscular movement is impaired, and also integrating sensory feedback into your current movement. So what can we do about it, right? There are speech and swallowing therapy options. We'll start with speech therapy first. Um, speech therapy goals should be individualized to your specific difficulties. So you go in and you tell your speech therapist, I have ataxia. They shouldn't say, oh, we have a, you have ataxia, these are the goals we're gonna do. No, they should evaluate your specific difficulties and develop goals based on what is most troubling to you. Everything should be individualized. So if you don't have a hard time with controlling your loudness, you shouldn't work on loudness. So focus on what, what is most difficult for you. The goal should be based on where in the speech mechanism is most disruptive to your speech. Is it breath control? Is it hypernasality? Is it voice quality, articulation, pitch and loudness control? There are more standardized treatment protocols that I will talk about. Their first one is called the Lee Silverman voice treatment, or we call it LSVT. Okay, what is LSVT? Um, you may, you probably have heard of it. This is a treatment that was de developed by Cynthia Fox, Lori Ramig, and Shyman Sapir in the early 2000s. And interesting, Lori Ramig used to be a professor at my program, University of Colorado Boulder. So we are one of the flagships of this program. It was originally developed for Parkinson's disease. The main concept of it is to speak loudly. And that's pretty much the entire premise of this program, is to train you to speak loudly. It is very intensive. You will do 16 one-hour treatment sessions across four consecutive days per week for four weeks. So you have to be able to commit a lot of time to this treatment. Um, and again, it's loudly. So you're going to be doing a lot of different speech tasks and then just focus on speaking loudly. The idea is that focusing solely on vocal loudness will improve vocal quality and intelligibility. Is it effective in ataxia? I will say it's effective in Parkinson's because in Parkinson's, the vocal folds are bowed, so they don't come together very effectively. So by focusing on loudness, you bring your vocal folds together. The same thing doesn't happen in ataxia. In ataxia, the vocal folds are not bowed. So, it's sometimes effective in ataxia. There have been two main studies, one in 2003 and then a more recent one in 2020. The one in 2003 was a case study um, of a woman with cerebellar dysfunction second to thiamine deficiency. 
That study found that it improved her voice quality, articulation, and intelligibility, but a larger, better study that was radar blind of 18 people with Friedrich's ataxia and one person with SCA6 and one person with idiopathic ataxia found that there were no changes in intelligibility and speech naturalness. So the jury is out. LSVT may be effective for some types of ataxia. It may be effective for you. I talked to someone today that LSVT was very effective for. Um, but it may not be effective for all types. So pros, it's a straightforward protocol that is often approved by insurance. Cons, there's limited effective for ataxia, and it's very, very time intensive. So something to think about. Do you want to devote your time to this when you don't know if it's going to be completely effective? That's up for you and your speech pathologist to talk through. Okay, the next treatment is breath control. There's not a standard protocol for breath control, but I wanna develop one. So that's my goal in my research right now, is to focus on a standard protocol for how we can improve breath control to improve speech production. Um, my idea is that if we focus on breath control alone, it will likely improve speech intelligibility and naturalness, um, as well as things like vocal quality and rate of speech. So what would be the goals in speech therapy for focusing on breath control? Maybe inhaling to an appropriate lung volume before you start speaking. Taking a breath at appropriate locations while speaking. Pr uh, producing more words per breath. Uh, taking a breath before you run out of air. There are lots of things we can do if we only focus on breath control that can have vast improvements on speech production. The advantage of this te technique is that you only focus on breath control. You don't have to think about your, your voice, your pitch, your loudness, your articulation. You only focus on breath control, and it should have really beautiful uh, uh, advantages to the rest of your speech. So that is my goal. I hope to develop this in the next few years, uh, but I do need funding for this work. So working on that, um, but keep your eye out for new research in this area. The next protocol is the Melbourne Ataxia Speech Treatment. Um, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Adam Vogel. He is a neuroscientist at the University of Melbourne in Australia. He does amazing work on speech and ataxia. The only thing is it's with an Australian accent, right? So not all of it translates to an American accent, but it's still very important for our research. He developed this treat speech treatment that's awesome. You spend 45 minutes a day for four weeks doing a computer program at home. So you can do it at home. Um, and what you do is you say words and sentences, you read a passage, and you practice pitch and loudness control exercises. The program gives you some feedback of your voice. And the goal is to improve intelligibility, vocal quality, and prosody. There were two studies done with this, and both found that this improved speech intelligibility, vocal quality, and pitch and loudness control. So I think this is a very promising speech treatment. It's convenient, it's at home, it's tailored specifically for ataxia. The only con is that it's currently for Australians. So I do want to talk with Dr. Vogel and see if we can translate this to the United States, because I think this is an absolutely wonderful tool. The last one is uh, AAC devices, which the long uh, drawn out term is called alternative and augmentative communication devices. These are um, physical devices that you use when your speech becomes so severely compromised that you no longer want to use your voice. You can use your voice in conjunction with a device as well to help uh, your communication partner try to figure out what you are saying. Um, also, if speech becomes highly fatiguing, maybe at the end of the day, you can use this device. There are many different types of AAC devices. Some are electronic, some are non-electronic. The electronic devices are generally on a tablet or an iPad. Um, they, you can use a keyboard to kind of type out what you're saying, but there can also be, oop, there's also symbols you can click that will help you figure out what you want to say. This is often funded by insurance. Um, it's insane how expensive these devices can be when you think it's just an iPad app. Um, the ones you purchase through insurance can be like $10,000, $15,000. I don't know why it costs that much money. Um, but you can also buy your own iPad and buy apps that are a lot less expensive. Some of them do are a few hundred dollars. There are some free versions. My personal um, kind of frame of mind is I want to make everything as accessible to people as possible. So if I developed a program, it would be free, but other people don't think the same way. Um, I do want to say is that your voice can be modified. So if you do use a device and you want to um, change the voice that speaks from the device, you can modify that voice. You can also participate in a thing called voice banking. 
This is where you create a synthetic voice using your own voice. And this is made by recording a large number of messages and then using AI to create the synthetic voice. There are a lot of companies that provide this service. So I have links up here. And then you can also email me for more information about these programs. There are also, again, lots of iPad apps. And a lot of these are great and a lot less expensive. Things like TouchChat, Proloquo to go. Uh, Quick Talk AAC, so a lot of great options for using for apps with AAC devices. And then non-tech options are wonderful. And I saw someone use this this week where uh, they were having a hard time listening to the, uh, understanding their friend. They pulled out a piece of paper and they wrote the alphabet. And then their friend touched the letter of, the, of what the word started with. And that helped improve the intelligibility of their message. So this is a great option. You write an alphabet on a piece of paper or print one out. And you can also include other phrases as well um, to help uh, common phrases as well. So this is a great option to carry around, especially since uh, tablets and phones can die. And this will never die, right? It's always available. OK, so standardized treatments for swallowing. Unfortunately, there is no standard protocol for treating dysphagia and ataxia. The goals should be individualized based on your specific difficulties. Likely goals include modifying the thickness of liquids, um, and that will help slow the swallow down for better coordination. There are different levels of thickness, and the SLP will figure out which one works better for you. They call it things like honey thick, nectar thick, things like that. And so that you add the thickener to your drink, and it helps slow the liquid down so you can, you can swallow better and improve coordination. Uh, you can also focus on improving swallow strength and speed. The stronger the swallow, the better at getting the food or liquid down uh, your pharynx. So that way you don't have residue hanging out that you can inhale later on. Improving cough strength. Coughing is really important for swallowing because if you penetrate food, you want to have a strong enough cough to be able to expel the food from your airway. Um, and then finding strategies that are effective for you. Sometimes these strategies are effective for you, and sometimes they're not. So I'm sure you've heard of this chin tuck while swallowing, so you chuck your chin while you take a swallow. That is very effective for some people and not effective for others. So I do not recommend this strategy as a, as a cure-all for everybody. You really need to get a swallow study to see if this is helpful for you. Some people find using a straw helps them coordinate. And then other people, oh, and then also swallowing twice per, per bite. So you take a bite and you swallow twice per bite. That's going to help with coordination and also help get the bolus all the way down the pharynx. OK, but what can we do at home? At home speech strategies. Um, I like to think of these strategies as a toolbox. You can pull the strategies out when you want to use them. For example, if you're on the phone, you have to make an important phone call, you're at a coffee shop and you want to order. A lot of strategies can become very fatiguing if you use them all the time. So, and that's kind of how we guide stuttering therapy, for example. There are strategies people pull out when they want to speak fluently, but otherwise it'd be really exhausting to use these strategies all the time. The first one is posture. Sitting upright makes it easier to use good breath support. It also improves vocal quality and pitch and loudness control. And it likely will enhance speech naturalness and intelligibility. So just a simple thing of posture. So again, if you find that you're, you answer a phone and you're having a hard time talking, just notice, are you laying down or are you sitting upright? Even just sitting upright can really help improve your speech quality. Breath control. Focus on taking a solid breath before speaking, but not too loud, too large. You don't want to take a huge breath because that is too much breath and, and too much force for speaking. So you want to take a nice solid breath, but not too large of a breath. You want to try to say about five to 10 words per breath. So see how many words you can say per breath and if you can kind of extend that. Um, and then take breath in between sentences. Sometimes what happens with incoordination is we run out of air and you want to take a breath, but you're in the middle of a word. And that's really going to disrupt the quality of that word is if you take a breath in the middle of the word. The next one is over-articulation, which I'm sure you've heard from your doctor or speech therapist. This is where you cue yourself to exaggerate your articulation. This will likely be very, very fatiguing. So use this sparingly when you really need to speak clearly. This is a good tool to use in special circumstances, an important phone call, for example. Um, and also, caregivers and partners, you should not expect your partner to 
over-articulate all the time because it is very, very fatiguing. We need to give um, our partners, our, our loved ones with ataxia, a chance to relax and not over-articulate, just to speak how we want to speak automatically because talking like this all the time can become very tiring. And the last one is slowing down, and I'm sure we've all heard this, just slow down, that will help, but not all the time. This helps for some people and not for others. Some people find that slowing down helps them articulate better. Other people do not find that slowing down helps. Other people find that it's actually exhausting. To think about slowing down feels unnatural and exhausting. So you can try this if it works for you. This is also a good thing to do with an SLP to figure out what rate of speech is most effective for you. At home swallow strategies. The first one is swallow strongly. So this is a cue for yourself when you swallow. Swallow strongly. Exaggerate your swallow and try to swallow strongly. This will help speed up your swallow and also push food or liquid down away from the airway. Swallow twice per bite. Often residue from food or liquid is left behind after the swallow. Swallowing twice will help clear that residue so it's not inhaled after the swallow. Sit upright when you're eating and drinking. Gravity will help pull that food or liquid down into your stomach instead of the airway. Take small bites. Small bites are easier to control and coordinate while swallowing. Focus on exhaling when swallowing. This is an interesting one because we don't usually think about breathing while swallowing. You should swallow on the exhale. So when you swallow, you start to exhale, you swallow, and you exhale. What happens in neurological conditions is often that respiratory cycle becomes disrupted. So maybe someone inhales and then swallows. Maybe they swallow and then inhale. Anytime you inhale before or after a swallow, you can pull the food or liquid into your airway. So focus, exhale, swallow, exhale. That is the safest respiratory cycle. Eat without distractions. This one's no fun, right? Eat uh, in, at a table, no TV, no phone, and just focus on eating, which I know is a lot easier to say than do, but this is the best thing to help you coordinate your swallow better. And then, oops, how do I go back? Oh, the last one is if you feel a choking sensation, Cough strongly. So I know we get that panicky feeling when we start to feel the choking sensation. But the best thing you can do is have a strong cough. We want to expel the food or liquid from our airway the best as possible and avoid infection. So you feel the choking sensation, use a very strong cough, and that will help expel the food. Um, so this is what we went over today, sp speech and swallowing difficulties, current theories, what we can do at home. Um, I know we don't have a lot of specific ataxia-designed therapies. I hope that changes in the next few years. But this is what we have for now. And if you have any questions or thoughts, you can email me anytime, allison.hilger at colorado.edu. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'm also recruiting for some studies on speech and swallowing as well. So anytime, I'd love to hear about it. Um, but for now, I'll take some questions if anybody has any questions about speech or swallowing. OK, and we have some microphones All right, Allison. Around. Here you go. Uh, does, does singing affect, overcome the uh, problems of ataxia? In other words, if this, I'm a former singer. If I'm at church and we're singing a hymn I've never heard before. Yes. And I'm trying to watch the bouncing ball. Yeah. I don't go do so well, but if we're singing a song that I'm very, very familiar with, I don't have any problems with the ataxy at all. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sort of like stuttering. Yes. Uh, it uses something different. Yes. This is a really fascinating topic. In uh, that case, would it help? Yes. Uh, the ataxia speech problem mm -hmm. to do more singing. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would say 
Overall, we don't know yet. There is a form of therapy called melodic intonation therapy that takes advantage of singing to improve language in aphasia. Aphasia is a different disorder that happens from stroke. It's a language disorder. So we already have a speech therapy treatment that takes advantage of singing. Singing is a wonderful thing because it uses more of your right hemisphere of your brain um, instead of language, mostly uses your left hemisphere. So it does take advantage of different neural areas and can definitely help improve speech in language disorders like aphasia. We don't know if it helps with ataxia, it doesn't hurt. So it's a good thing to try. Um, I would, my personal professional opinion is yes. I think it's a great tool to join a choir, um, challenge your brain by learning new songs. I'm guessing that other songs that you're already familiar with are easier to, to sing because you already have these strong motor plans for those songs and you don't have to consciously think about it. But yes, I think it's a great tool. And another thing is I've talked with someone who told me that when she reads stories to her grandchildren, she doesn't notice her ataxic speech symptoms. It's like when she uses a silly character voice or an accent, suddenly she can talk really naturally and really intelligibly. And there's definitely something about getting away from kind of your normal, natural, you know, voice that you're used to and using something different that uses different neural mechanisms. And it's not something we could do all the time. I can't just go around talking in a different accent. But there's something going on there that we could take advantage of in therapy. So that is a study I want to do sometime, is to, to record people talking silly or talking with an accent and seeing what happens with their speech. But that's a really interesting idea. So I would say, yes, singing or uh, acting, things like that, can be very beneficial for speech. We don't have hard evidence for it, but I can see how taking advantage of different neural areas can be very beneficial. All right, Allison, we have another question here. Oh, I got you, Kelsey. <laughs> Is there any evidence in the research that shows um, breath work, um, breathing strategies, like maybe a, a breathing home program um, could be indicated um, to have beneficial effects for ataxia, <laughs> knowing what we do about posture um, mm -hmm. and how, you know, yes, uh, <laughs> could, could there be beneficially, you know, mm -hmm. anything yes. positive from that? Definitely. Um, yeah, so we do know that focusing on breath control, improving respiratory support helps with other symptoms of ataxia. Um, there's a lot of evidence that doing things like Tai Chi, which focus on breath support, can really improve balance and gait and posture in ataxia. We don't have any research yet on breath support, respiratory control for speech and swallowing. That's what I will be doing in the next few years um, because I think it will be very effective. Um, but yes. Focusing on breath control, I personally believe, is one of the best things we can do in ataxia for improving ataxic symptoms. Yes. How much do you, have you seen dyspraxia in ataxia clients? Okay, so dyspraxia, there's a, a few different forms of um, impairments that can happen where difficulties writing, reading, doing math, um, dysgraphia, dyspraxia. I personally have not seen that very often in ataxia. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I would say it's a different part of the brain that's usually impaired, but the cerebellum is connected to so many parts of the brain that I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so I think it's kind of an open question, but really good question. Yeah. I didn't hear you um, speak much about uh, tongue and mouth exercises. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a video on the NFA website during COVID uh, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, have you looked into auctioneering ex uh, exercises to improve the oh, speech? Uh, that would be great. One of That's them is uh, counting backwards from 100 to zero yes. by two and a halves. Yeah. Because if you can do that... Uh, counting forward, it's yeah. without thought. Yeah, great points. Okay, so oftentimes you're going to go to a speech therapist and they give you a list of exercises, like push your tongue out and in 10 times, push it against a tongue depressor. Um, that could help with your swallow. That is not going to help with your speech. There's no evidence that improving strength of oral muscles helps speech. Um, so, but it could help with swallowing. We don't have evidence that's going to help with swallowing. 
The thing is with ataxia is the main impairment is with coordination of muscle. There's not necessarily muscle weakness unless there's something more going on. So especially spinal cerebellar ataxia, usually the damage is localized to the cerebellum, but if it continues down the spinal cord, then you might get some muscle weakness. But ataxia generally, we would not expect there to be a lot of muscle weakness in those muscles for speech or swallowing. So I would not recommend personally doing those oral motor exercises. There are many more beneficial treatments to start first. It doesn't hurt, but I don't necessarily think it's the best treatment to focus on for ataxia. Yeah. Hi. Does too much saliva affect the clarity of the, the speech. And if so, what can be done about it? So let me clarify the question. So what can be done about what exactly? If there is too much saliva. Oh, too much saliva. What can be done about too much saliva in the mouth? So we don't know exactly why there's too much saliva in the mouth from ataxia. Possibly the, uh, the main reason is probably because you're not swallowing enough, and that's because of impaired sensory information. So your mouth tells you it feels too much saliva, and it tells you to swallow, and that's how you kind of regulate how much saliva is in the mouth. But if you have this disrupted sensory information, you're not, the, those signals aren't getting to your brain to say there's too much saliva, so it accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. We don't have like uh, definitive treatments for that. I know there's some medications that can reduce saliva in your mouth. I don't know if those are effective or not for ataxia. Um, but I think the main thing is just to consciously think about swallowing that saliva frequently, which again is another thing we have to consciously think about, which can add to fatigue. But I think that's our main approach right now is to, to constantly cue ourselves. okay, I should be swallowing that so it doesn't build up in my mouth. But that is a huge issue that I hear from people, and it's something that we need to develop better treatments for. So Allison, I have some online questions for yes. you. Um, and actually I have two tips. So one tip is um, someone is sharing his best swallowing tip that they've received at a swallow study was don't talk while eating, do yes. one or the other. Yes, so. yes. And that's a good tip because when you talk, you're having a lot of different respiratory patterns. And when you swallow, you want to make sure your airway is closed off. So if you interchange that, you may have an open airway while swallowing. So that's a great tip. No eating while talking. There was another um, little jingle, I'll call it, that came through. And this person has said that when her sister was a new mom, she learned to help her kids when they choked by saying, loud and red, go ahead, quiet and blue, they need help from you. Oh. So just a cute little that is nice. jingle. Yeah. And then the last question from our um, virtual audience is, what is stuttering like speech from? Oh. What causes that? Oh, I wish we knew. That is like the <laughs> mysterious question of my field coming from like the early 1900s, right? We don't know it causes stuttering. We think there's a part of the brain, a, a network in the brain that's disrupted. Um, we also know that stuttering is another condition where feedback is impaired. Oftentimes people who stutter, if you delay their speech, their feedback, they will become more fluent. So there's something about changing auditory feedback but we don't know. Um, but what I can say is the neural indices for stuttering versus ataxia are not related. So if you find yourself stuttering or having stutter-like disfluencies, there's something else going on besides ataxia. But very big question to ask. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Allison, we do need to wrap up, but I would love to give it, you a round of applause. That was really helpful Thank you so much. Yes. It was thank wonderful. You. Thank you all.